Part two, chapter two of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some new lessons. The six years that followed Sir Nicholas' return and Hubert's departure for the north had passed uneventfully at Great Keynes. The old knight had been profoundly shocked that any Catholic, especially an agent so valuable as Mr. Stuart, should have found his house a death trap and although he continued receiving his friends and succouring them he did so with more real caution and less ostentation of it his religious zeal and discretion were further increased by the secret return to the old religion of several of his villagers during the period and a very fair congregation attended mass so often as it was said in the cloister wing of the hall the new rector like his predecessor was content to let the squire alone and unlike him had no wife to make trouble then suddenly in the summer of seventy seven catastrophes began headed by the unexpected return of hubert impatient of waiting and with new plans in his mind isabel had been out with mistress margaret walking in the dusk one august evening after supper on the raised terrace beneath the yews they had been listening to the loud snoring of young owls in the ivy on the chimney-stack opposite, and had watched the fierce bird slide silently out of the gloom, white against the blackness, and disappear down among the meadows. Once Isabel had seen him pause, too, on one of his return journeys, suspicious of the dim figures beneath, silhouetted on a branch against the luminous green western sky with the outline of a mouse with its hanging tail plain in his crooked claws before he glided to his nest again as isabel waited she heard the bang of the garden door but gave it no thought and a moment after mistress margaret asked her to fetch a couple of wraps from the house for them both as the air had a touch of chill in it she came down the lichened steps crossed the lawn and passed into the unlighted hall as she entered the door opposite opened and for a moment she saw the silhouette of a man's figure against the bright passage beyond her heart suddenly leaped and stood still anthony she whispered in a hush of suspense there was a vibration and a step beside her isabel said hubert's voice and then his arms closed round her for the first time in her life she struggled and panted a moment as she felt his breath on her face and he released her she recoiled to the door and stood there silent and panting oh isabel he whispered and again isabel she put out her hand and grasped the doorpost behind her oh hubert why have you come he came a step nearer and she could see the faint whiteness of his face in the western glimmer i cannot wait he said i have been nearly beside myself i have left the north and i cannot wait so long well she said and he heard the note of entreaty and anxiety in her voice i have my plans he answered i will tell you to-morrow where is my aunt isabel heard a step on the gravel outside she is coming she said sharply hubert melted into the dark and she saw the opposite door open and let him out the next day hubert announced his plans to sir nicholas and a conflict followed i cannot go on sir he said i cannot wait for ever i am treated like a servant too and you know how miserably i am paid i have obeyed you for six years sir and now i have thrown up the post and told my lord to his face that i can bear with him no longer sir nicholas face as he sat in his upright chair opposite the boy grew flushed with passion it is your accursed temper sir he said violently i know you of old wait for what for the protestant girl i told you to put that from your mind sir hubert did not propose as yet to let his father into all his plans i have not spoken her name sir i think i say i cannot wait for my fortune i may be impatient sir i do not deny it 
"'Then how do you propose to better it?' sneered his father. "'In November,' said Hubert steadily, looking his father in the eyes, "'I sail with Mr. Drake.' Sir Nicholas' face grew terrific. He rose and struck the table twice with his clenched fist. "'Then, by God, sir, Mr. Drake may have you now!' Hubert's face grew white with anger, but he had his temper under control. "'Then I wish you good day, sir,' and he left the room. When the boy had left the house again for London, as he did the same afternoon, Lady Maxwell tried to soothe the old man. It was impossible even for her to approach him before. "'Sweetheart,' she said tranquilly as he sat and glowered at his plate when supper was over and the men had left the room sweetheart we must have hubert down here again he must not sail with mr drake the old man's face flared up again in anger he may follow his own devices he cried i care not what he does he has given up the post that i asked for him and he comes striding and ruffling home with his hat cocked and and his voice became inarticulate he is only a boy sweetheart with a boy's hot blood you would sooner have him like that than a milksop besides he is our boy the old man growled his wife went on and now that james cannot have the estate he must have it as you know and carry on the old name he has disgraced it burst out the angry old man and he is going now with that damned protestant to harry catholics by the grace of god i love my country and would serve her grace with my heart's blood but that my boy should go with uh, uh, drake and again his voice failed it was a couple of days before she could obtain her husband's leave to write a conciliatory letter giving leave to hubert to go with drake if he had made any positive engagement because as she represented to sir nicholas there was nothing actually wrong or disloyal to the faith in it but in treating him with much pathos not to leave his old parents so bitterly oh my dear son the end of the letter ran your father is old and god in whose hand are our days alone knows how long he will live and i too my son am old so come back to us and be our dear child again you must not think too hardly of your father's words to you he is quick and hot as you are too but indeed we love you dearly your room here is ready for you and piers wants a firm hand now over him as your father is so old so come back my darling and make our old hearts glad again but the weeks passed by and no answer came and the old people's hearts grew sick with suspense and then at last in september the courier brought a letter written from plymouth which told the mother that it was too late that he had in fact engaged himself to mr drake in august before he had come to great keynes at all and that in honour he must keep his engagement he asked pardon of his father for his hastiness but it seemed a cold and half-hearted sorrow and the letter ended by announcing that the little fleet would sail in november and that at present they were busy fitting the ships and engaging the men and that there would be no opportunity for him to return to wish them good-bye before he sailed it was plain that the lad was angry still sir nicholas did not say much but a silence fell on the house lady maxwell sent for isabel and they had a long interview the old lady was astonished at the girl's quietness and resignation yes she said she loved hubert with all her heart she had loved him for a long while no she was not angry only startled what would she do about the difference in religion could she marry him while one was a catholic and the other a protestant 
No, they would never be happy like that, and she did not know what she would do. She supposed she would wait and see. Yes, she would wait and see. That was all that could be done and then had come a silent burst of tears and the girl had sunk down on her knees and hidden her face in the old lady's lap and the wrinkled jewelled old hand passed quietly over the girl's black hair but no more had been said and isabel presently got up and went home to the dower house the autumn went by and november came and there was no further word from hubert then towards the end of november a report reached them from anthony at lambeth that the fleet had sailed but had put back into falmouth after a terrible storm in the channel and hope just raised its head then one evening after supper sir nicholas complained of fever and restlessness and went early to bed in the night he was delirious mistress margaret hastened up at midnight from the dower house and a groom galloped off to lindfield before morning to fetch the doctor and another to fetch Mr. Barnes the priest from Cuckfield. Sir Nicholas was bled to reduce the fever of the pneumonia that had attacked him. All day long he was sinking. About eleven o'clock that night he fell asleep, apparently, and Lady Maxwell, who had watched incessantly, was persuaded to lie down. But at three o'clock in the morning on the first of December, Mistress Margaret awakened her, and together they knelt by the bedside of the old man, the priest who had anointed him on the previous evening knelt behind repeating the prayers for the dying sir nicholas lay on his back supported by pillows under the gloom of the black old four-posted bed a wood fire glowed on the hearth and the air was fragrant with the scent of the burning cedar logs a crucifix was in the old man's hands but his eyes were bright with fever and his fingers every now and then relaxed and then tightened their hold again on the cool silver of the figure of the crucified saviour his lips were moving tremulously and his ruddy old face was pale now the priest's voice went on steadily the struggle was beginning proficiscere anima christiana de hoc mundo go forth christian soul from this world in the name of god the father almighty who created thee in the name of jesus christ son of the living god who suffered for thee in the name of the holy ghost who was shed forth upon thee in the name of angels and archangels in the name of thrones and dominions in the name of principalities and powers suddenly the old man whose head had been slowly turning from side to side ceased his movement and his open mouth closed he was looking steadily at his wife, and a look of recognition came back to his eyes. Sweetheart, he said, and smiled, and died. Isabel did not see much of Mistress Margaret for the next few days. She was constantly with her sister, and when she came to the dower house now and then, said little to the girl. There were curious rumors in the village. Strangers came and went continually and there was a vast congregation at the funeral when the body of the old knight was laid to rest in the maxwell chapel the following day the air of mystery deepened and young mrs melton whispered to isabel with many glances and becks that she and her man had seen lights through the chapel windows at three o'clock that morning isabel went into the chapel presently to visit the grave and there was a new smear of black on the east wall as if a taper had been set too near the courier who had been dispatched to announce to hubert that his father had died and left him master of the hall and estate with certain conditions returned at the end of the month with the news that the fleet had sailed again on the thirteenth and that hubert was gone with it so lady maxwell now more silent and retired than ever for the present retained her old position and mr piers took charge of the estate although isabel outwardly was very little changed in the last six years great movements had been taking place in her soul and if hubert had only known the state of the case possibly he would not have gone so hastily with mr drake the close companionship of such an one as mistress margaret was doing its almost inevitable work 
and the girl had been learning that behind the brilliant and even crude surface of the catholic practice there lay still and beautiful depths of devotion which she had scarcely dreamed of the old nun's life was a revelation to isabel she heard from her bed in the black winter mornings her footsteps in the next room and soon learnt that mistress margaret spent at least two hours in prayer before she appeared at all two or three times in the day she knew that she retired again for the same purpose and again an hour after she was in bed there were the same gentle movements next door she began to discover too that for the catholic as well as for the puritan the person of the saviour was the very heart of religion that her own devotion to christ was a very languid flame by the side of the ardent inarticulate passion of this soul who believed herself his wedded spouse and that the worship of the saints and the blessed mother instead of distracting the love of the christian soul rather seemed to augment it the king of love stood as she fancied sometimes to catholic eyes in a glow of ineffable splendour and the faces of his adoring court reflected the ruddy glory on all sides thus refracting the light of their central sun instead of as she had thought obscuring it other difficulties too began to seem oddly unreal and intangible when she had looked at them in the light of mistress margaret's clear old eyes and candid face it was a real event in her inner life when she first began to understand what the rosary meant to catholics mistress corbett had told her what was the actual use of the beads and how the mysteries of christ's life and death were to be pondered over as the various prayers were said but it had hitherto seemed to isabel as if this method were an elaborate and superstitious substitute for reading the inspired record of the new testament she had been sitting out in the little walled garden in front of the dower house one morning on an early summer day after her father's death and mistress margaret had come out in her black dress and stood for a moment looking at her irresolutely framed in the dark doorway then she had come slowly across the grass and isabel had seen for the first time in her fingers a string of ivory beads mistress margaret sat down on a garden chair a little way from her and let her hands sink into her lap still holding the beads isabel said nothing but went on reading presently she looked up again and the old lady's eyes were half closed and her lips just moving and the beads passing slowly through her fingers she looked almost like a child dreaming in spite of her wrinkles and her snowy hair the pale light of a serene soul lay on her face this did not look like the mechanical performance that isabel had always associated with the idea of beads so the minutes passed away every time that isabel looked up there was the little white face with the long lashes lying on the cheek and the crown of snowy hair and lace and the luminous look of a soul in conscious communion with the unseen when the old lady had finished she twisted the beads about her fingers and opened her eyes isabel had an impulse to speak mistress margaret she said may i ask you something of course my darling the old lady said i have never seen you use those before i cannot understand them what is it asked the old lady that you don't understand how can prayers said over and over again like that be any good mistress margaret was silent for a moment i saw young mrs martin last week she said with her little girl in her lap amy had her arms round her mother's neck and was being rocked to and fro and every time she rocked she said oh mother but then said isabel after a moment's silence she was only a child except you become like little children quoted mistress margaret softly you see my isabel we are nothing more than children with god 
and his blessed mother to say hail mary hail mary is the best way of telling her how much we love her and then this string of beads is like our lady's girdle and her children love to finger it and whisper to her and then we say our paternosters too and all the while we are talking she is showing us pictures of her dear child and we look at all the great things he did for us one by one and then we turn the page and begin again i see said isabel and after a moment or two's silence mistress margaret got up and went into the house the girl sat still with her hands clasped round her knee how strange and different this religion was to the fiery gospel she had heard last year at northampton from the harsh stern preacher at whose voice a veil seemed to rend and show a red hot heaven behind how tender and simple this was like a blue summer sky with drifting clouds if only it was true if only there were a great mother whose girdle was of beads strung together which dangled into every christian's hands whose face bent down over every christian's bed and whose mighty and tender arms that had held her son and god were still stretched out beneath her other children and isabel whose soul yearned for a mother sighed as she reminded herself that there was but one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus and so the time went by like an outgoing tide silent and steady the old nun did not talk much to the girl about dogmatic religion for she was in a difficult position she was timid certainly of betraying her faith by silence but she was also timid of betraying her trust by speech sometimes she felt she had gone too far sometimes not far enough but on the whole her practice was never to suggest questions but only to answer them when isabel asked and to occupy herself with affirmative rather than with destructive criticism more than this she hesitated to do out of honour for the dead less than this she dared not do out of love for god and isabel but there were three or four conversations that she felt were worth waiting for and the look on isabel's face afterwards and the sudden questions she would ask sometimes after a fit of silence made her friend's heart quicken towards her and her prayers more fervent the two were sitting together one december day in isabel's upstairs room and the girl who had just come in from a solitary walk was half kneeling on the window-seat and drumming her fingers softly on the panes as she looked out at the red western sky i used to think she said that catholics had no spiritual life but now it seems to me that in comparison we puritans have none you know so much about the soul as to what is from god and what from the evil one and we have to grope for ourselves and yet our saviour said that his sheep should know his voice i do not understand it and she turned towards mistress margaret who had laid down her work and was listening dear child she said if you mean our priests and spiritual writers it is because they study it we believe in the science of the soul and we consult our spiritual guides for our soul's health as the leech for our body's health but why must you ask the priest if the lord speaks to all alike he speaks through the priest my dear as he does through the physician but why should the priest know better than the people pursued isabel intent on her point because he tells us what the church says said the other smiling it is his business he need not be any better or cleverer in other respects the baker may be a thief or a foolish fellow but his bread is good but how do you know went on isabel who thought mistress margaret a little slow to see her point 
how do you know that the church is right the old nun considered a moment and then lifted her embroidery again why do you think she asked beginning to sew that each single soul that asks god's guidance is right because the holy ghost is promised to such said isabel wondering then is it not likely went on the other still stitching that the millions of souls who form holy church are right when they all agree together isabel moved a little impatiently you see went on mistress margaret that is what we catholics believe our saviour meant when he said that the gates of hell should not prevail against his church but isabel was not content she broke in but why are not the scriptures sufficient they are god's word the other put down her embroidery again and smiled up into the girl's puzzled eyes well my child she said do they seem sufficient when you look at christendom now if they are so clear how is it that you have the lutherans and the anabaptists and the family of love and the calvinists and the church of england all saying they hold to the scriptures alone nay nay the scriptures are the grammar and the church is the dame that teaches out of it and she knows so well much that is not in the grammar and we name that tradition but where there is no dame to teach the children soon fall a-fighting about the book and the meaning of it isabel looked at mistress margaret a moment and then turned back again to the window in silence at another time they had a word or two about peter's prerogatives surely said isabel suddenly as they walked together in the garden christ is the one foundation of the church st paul tells us so expressly yes my dear said the nun but then christ our lord said thou art peter and on this rock i will build my church so he who is the only good shepherd said to peter feed my sheep and he that is clavis david and that openeth and none shutteth said to him i will give thee the keys and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven that is why we call peter the vicar of christ isabel raised her eyebrows surely surely she began yes my child said mistress margaret i know it is new and strange to you but it was not to your grandfather or his forebears to them as to me it is the plain meaning of the words we catholics are a simple folk we hold that what our saviour said simply he meant simply as we do in the sacred mystery of his body and blood to us you know she went on smiling with a hand on the girl's arm it seems as if you protestants twisted the word of god against all justice isabel smiled back at her but she was puzzled the point of view was new to her and yet in the garden a few months later as they sat out together on the lawn the girl opened the same subject mistress margaret she said i have been thinking a great deal and it seems very plain when you talk but you know our great divines could answer you though i cannot my father was no papist and dr grindal and the bishops are all wise men how do you answer that the nun looked silently down at the grass a moment or two it is the old tale she said at last looking up we cannot believe that the babes and sucklings are as likely to be right in such matters as the wise and prudent even more likely if our saviour's words are to be believed dear child do you not see that our lord came to save all men and call all men into his church and that therefore he must have marked his church in such a manner that the most ignorant may perceive it as easily as the most learned 
learning is very well and it is the gift of god but salvation and grace cannot depend upon it it needs an architect to understand why paul's church is strong and beautiful and what makes it so but any child or foolish fellow can see that it is so i do not understand said isabel wrinkling her forehead why this that you are as likely to know the catholic church when you see it as dr grindal or dr freak or your dear father himself only a divine can explain about it and understand it but you and i are as fit to see it and walk into it as any of them but then why are they not all catholics asked isabel still bewildered ah said the nun softly god alone knows who reads hearts and calls whom he will but learning at least has not to do with it conversations of this kind that took place now and then between the two were sufficient to show mistress margaret like tiny bubbles on the surface of a clear stream the swift movement of this limpid soul that she loved so well but on the other hand all the girl's past life and most sacred and dear associations were in conflict with this movement the memory of her quiet wise father rose and reproached her sometimes anthony's enthusiastic talk when he came down from lambeth on the glorious destinies of the church of england and her gallant protests against the corruptions of the west and of her future unique position in christendom as the national church of the most progressive country all this caused her to shrink back terrified from the bourne to which she was drifting and from the breach that must follow with her brother but above all else that caused her pain was the shocking suspicion that her love for hubert perhaps was influencing her and that she was living in gross self-deception as to the sincerity of her motives this culminated at last in a scene that seriously startled the old nun it took place one summer night after hubert's departure in mr drake's expedition mistress margaret had seen isabel to her room and an hour later had finished her night office and was thinking of preparing herself to bed when there was a hurried tap at the door and isabel came quickly in her face pale and miserable her great gray eyes full of trouble and distraction and her hair on her shoulders my dear child said the nun what is it isabel closed the door and stood looking at her with her lips parted how can i know mistress margaret she said in the voice of a sleepwalker whether this is the voice of god or of my own wicked self no no she went on as the other came towards her frightened let me tell you i must speak yes my child you shall but come and sit down first and she drew her to a chair and set her in it and threw a wrap over her knees and feet and sat down beside her and took one of her hands and held it between her own now then isabel what is it i have been thinking over it all so long began the girl in the same tremulous voice with her eyes fixed on the nun's face and to-night in bed i could not bear it any longer you see i love hubert and i used to think i loved our saviour too but now i do not know it seems as if he was leading me to the catholic church all is so much more plain and easy there it seems it seems to make sense in the catholic church and all the rest of us are wandering in the dark but if i become a catholic you see i can marry hubert then and i cannot help thinking of that and wanting to marry him but then perhaps that is the reason that i think i see it all so plainly just because i want to see it plainly and what am i to do why will not our lord show me my own heart and what is his will mistress margaret shook her head gently dear child she said our saviour loves you and wishes to make you happy do you not think that perhaps he is helping you and making it easy in this way by drawing you to his church through hubert 
why should not both be his will that you should become a catholic and marry hubert as well yes said isabel but how can i tell there is only one thing to be done went on the old lady be quite simple and quiet whenever your soul begins to be disturbed and anxious put yourself in his hands and refuse to decide for yourself it is so easy so easy but why should i be so anxious and disturbed if it were not our lord speaking and warning me in the catholic church said mistress margaret we know well about all those movements of the soul and we call them scruples you must resist them dear child like temptations we are told that if a soul is in grace and desires to serve god then whenever our lord speaks it is to bring sweetness with him and when it is the evil one he brings disturbance and that is why i am sure that these questionings are not from god you feel stifled is it not so when you try to pray and all seems empty of god the waves and storms are going over you but lie still and be content and refuse to be disturbed and you will soon be at peace again and see the light clearly mistress margaret found herself speaking simply in short words and sentences as to a child she had seen that for a long while past the clouds had been gathering over isabel and that her soul was at present completely overcast and unable to perceive or decide anything clearly and so she gave her this simple advice and did her utmost to soothe her knowing that such a clean soul would not be kept long in the dark she knelt down with isabel presently and prayed aloud with her in a quiet even voice a patch of moonlight lay on the floor and something of its white serenity seemed to be in the old nun's tones as she entreated the merciful lord to bid peace again to this anxious soul and to let her see light again through the dark and when she had taken isabel back again to her own room at last and had seen her safely into bed and kissed her good night already the girl's face was quieter as it lay on the pillow and the lines were smoothed out of her forehead god bless you said mistress margaret end of chapter two part two chapter three of by what authority by robert hugh benson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hubert's Return After the sailing of Mr. Drake's expedition, the friends of the adventurers had to wait in patience for several months before news arrived. Then the Elizabeth, under the command of Mr. Winter, which had been separated from Mr. Drake's Pelican in a gale off the southwest coast of America, returned to england bringing the news of mr doughty's execution for desertion but of the pelican herself there was no further news until complaints arrived from the viceroy of new spain of mr drake's ravages up the west coast then silence again fell for eighteen months anthony had followed the fortunes of the pelican in which hubert had sailed with a great deal of interest and it was with real relief that after the burst of joy in london at the news of her safe return to plymouth with an incalculable amount of plunder he had word from lady maxwell that she hoped he would come down at once to great Keynes and help to welcome hubert home he was not able to go at once for his duties detained him but a couple of days after the hall had welcomed its new master anthony was at the dower house again with isabel he found her extraordinarily bright and vivacious and was delighted at the change for he had been troubled the last time he had seen her a few months before at her silence and listlessness but her face was radiant now as she threw herself into his arms at the door and told him that they were all to go to supper that night at the hall and that hubert had been keeping his best stories on purpose for his return 
she showed him when they got up to his room at last little things hubert had given her carved nuts a spanish coin or two and an ingot of gold but of which she would say nothing but only laugh and nod her head hubert too when he saw him that evening seemed full of the same sort of half-suppressed happiness that shone out now and again suddenly there he sat for hours after supper that night broader and more sunburnt than ever with his brilliant eyes glancing round as he talked and his sinewy man's hand in the delicate creamy ruff making little explanatory movements and drawing a map once or twice in spilled wine on the polished oak the three ladies sat forward and watched him breathlessly or leaned back and sighed as each tale ended and anthony found himself too carried away with enthusiasm again and again as he looked at this gallant sea-dog in his gold chain and satin and jewels and listened to his stories it was bitter cold said hubert in his strong voice telling them of mr doughty's death on the morning itself and snow lay on the decks when we rose mr fletcher had prepared a table in the poop cabin with a white cloth and bread and wine and at nine of the clock we were all assembled that we might see into the cabin and mr fletcher said the communion service and mr drake and mr doughty received the sacrament there at his hands some of mr doughty's men had all they could do to keep back their tears for you know mother they were good friends and then when it was done we made two lines down the deck to where the block stood by the main mast and the two came down together and they kissed one another there and mr doughty spoke to the men and bade them pray for the queen's grace with him and they did and then he and mr drake put off their doublets and mr doughty knelt at the block and said another prayer or two and then laid his head down and he was shivering a little with the cold and then when he gave the sign mr drake and hubert brought the edge of his hand down sharply and the glasses rang and the ladies drew quick hissing breaths and lady maxwell put her hand on her son's arm as he looked round on all their faces then he told them of the expedition up the west coast and of the towns they sacked and the opulent names rolled oddly off his tongue and seemed to bring a whiff of southern scent into this panelled english room valparaiso tarapaca and arica and of the capture of the cacafuego off quibdo and of the enormous treasure they took the great golden crucifix with emeralds the size of pigeons eggs and the chests of pearls and the twenty-six tons of silver and the wedges of pure gold from the peruvian galleon and of the golden falcon from the chinese trader that they captured south of guatulco and he described the search up the coast for the passage eastwards that never existed and of drake's superb resolve to return westwards instead by the moluccas and how they stayed at Terngate, south of celebes and coasted along java seeking a passage and found it in the sunda strait and broke out from the treacherous islands into the open sea crossed to africa rounded the cape of good hope came up the west coast touching at sierra leone and so home again along the spanish and french coasts to plymouth sound and the pealing of plymouth bells and he broke out into something very like eloquence when he spoke of drake never was such a captain he cried with his little stiff beard and his obstinate eyes i have seen him stand on the poop when the arrows were like hail on the deck with one finger in the ring round his neck so and hubert thrust a tanned finger into a link of his chain and lifted his chin just making little signs to the steersman with his hand behind his back to bring the ship nearer to the spaniard as cool i tell you as cool as if we were playing marals oh and then when we boarded out came his finger from his ring and there was none that struck so true and fierce and all in silence too without an oath or a cry or a word 
except maybe to give an order but he was very sharp with all that angered him when we sighted the madre de dios i ran into his cabin to tell him of it without saluting so full was my head of the chase and he looked at me like ice and then roared at me to know where my manners were and bade me go out and enter again properly before he would hear my news <laughs> and then i heard him rating the man that stood at his door for letting me pass in that state <laughs> at his dinner too which he took alone there were always trumpets to blow as when her grace dines when he laughed it seemed as if he did it with a grave face there was a piece of grand fooling when we got out from among those weary indian islands where the great crabs be and flies that burn in the dark as i told you mr fletcher the minister played the coward one night when we ran aground and bade us think of our sins and our immortal souls instead of urging us to be smart about the ship and he did it too not as mr drake might do but in such a melancholy voice as if we were all at our last hour so when we were free of our trouble and out on the main again we were all called by the drum to the forecastle and there mr drake sat on a sea chest as solemn as a judge so that not a man durst laugh with a pair of pantoufles in his hand and mr fletcher was brought before him trying to smile as if it was a jest for him too between two guards and there he was arraigned and the witnesses were called and tom moore said how he was tapped on the shoulder by mr fletcher as he was getting a pick from the hold and how he was as white as a ghost and bade him think on mr doughty how there was no mercy for him when he needed it and so there would be none for us <laughs> and then other witnesses came and then mr fletcher tried to make his defence saying how it was the part of a minister to bid men think on their souls but twas no good mr drake declared him guilty and sentenced him to be kept in irons till he repented of that his cowardice and then which was the cream of the joke since the prisoner was a minister mr drake declared him excommunicate and cut off from the church of god and given over to the devil and he was put in irons too for a while so twas not all a joke and what is mr drake doing now asked lady maxwell oh drake is in london said hubert oh yes and you must all come to deptford when her grace is going to be there anthony lad you'll come anthony said he would certainly do his best and isabel put out her hand to her brother and beamed at him and then turned to look at hubert again and what are you to do next asked mistress margaret well he said i am to go to plymouth again presently to help to get the treasure out of the ships and i must be there too for the spring and summer for drake wants me to help him with his new expedition but you're not going with him again my son said his mother quickly hubert put out his hand to her no no he said i've written to tell him i cannot i must take my father's place here he will understand and he gave one swift glance at isabel and her eyes fell anthony was obliged to return to lambeth after a day or two and he carried with him a heart full of admiration and enthusiasm for his friend he had wondered once or twice too as his eyes fell on isabel whether there was anything in what mistress corbett had said but he dared not speak to her and still less to hubert unless his confidence was first sought the visit to deptford which took place a week or two later gave an additional spurt to anthony's nationalism london was all on fire at the return of the buccaneers and as anthony rode down the south bank of the river from lambeth to join the others at the inn the three miles of river beyond london bridge were an inspiriting sight in the bright winter sunshine crowded with craft of all kinds bright with bunting that were making their way down to the naval triumph the road too was thick with vehicles and pedestrians it was still early when he met his party at the inn and hubert took them immediately to see the pelican that was drawn up in a little creek on the south bank mistress margaret had not come 
so the four went together all over the ship that had been for these years the perilous home of this sunburnt lad they all loved so well hubert pointed out drake's own cabin at the poop with its stern windows where the last sacrament of the two friends had been celebrated and where drake himself had eaten in royal fashion to the sound of trumpets and slept with all night sentries at his door he showed them too his own cabin where he had lived with three more officers and the upper poop deck where drake would sit hour after hour with his spy-glass ranging the horizons for treasure ships and he showed them too the high forecastle and the men's quarters and isabel fingered delicately the touch-holes of the very guns that had roared and snapped so fiercely at the dawns and they peered down into the dark empty hold where the treasure chests had lain and up at the three masts and the rigging that had borne so long the swift wings of the pelican and they heard the hiss and rattle of the ropes as hubert ordered a man to run up a flag to show them how it was done and they smelled the strange tarry briny smell of a sea-going ship you are not tired anthony said to his sister as they walked back to the inn from which they were to see the spectacle she shook her head happily and anthony looking at her once more questioned himself whether mistress corbett were right or not when they had settled down at last to their window the crowds were gathering thicker every moment about the entrance to the ship which lay in the creek perhaps a hundred yards from the inn and on the road along which the queen was to come from greenwich anthony felt his whole heart go out in sympathy to these joyous shouting folk beneath who were here to celebrate the gallant pluck of a little bearded man and his followers who for the moment stood for england and in whose presence just now the queen herself must take second place even the quacks and salesmen who were busy in their booths all round used patriotism to push their bargains spanish ointment spanish ointment bellowed a red-faced herbalist in a doctor's gown just below the window the dons know what's best for wounds and knocks after frankie drake's visit and the crowd laughed and bought up his boxes and another drove a roaring business in green glass beads reported to be the exact size of the emeralds taken from the cacafuego and others sold little models of the pelican warranted to frighten away dawns and all other kinds of devils from the house that possessed one isabel laughed with pleasure and sent anthony down to buy one for her but perhaps more than all else the sight of the seamen themselves stirred his heart most of them officers as well as men were dressed with absurd extravagance for the prize money even after the deduction of the queen's lion's share had been immense but beneath their plumed and jewel-buckled caps brown faces looked out alert and capable with tight lips and bright puckered eyes with something of the terrier in their expression there they swaggered along with a slight roll in their walk by ones or twos through the crowd that formed lanes to let them pass and surged along in their wake shouting after them and clapping them on the back anthony watched them eagerly as they made their way from all directions to where the pelican lay for it was close on noon then from far away came the boom of the tower guns and then the nearer crash of those that guarded the dockyard and last the deafening roar of the pelican broadside and then the smoke rose and drifted in a heavy veil in the keen frosty air over the cheering crowds when it lifted again there was the flash of gold and color from the greenwich road and the high braying of the trumpets pierced the roaring welcome of the people but the watchers at the windows could see no more over the heads of the crowd than the plumes of the royal carriage as the queen dismounted and a momentary glimpse of her figure and the group round her as she passed on to the deck of the pelican and went immediately below to the banquet while the parish church bells pealed a welcome lady maxwell insisted that isabel should now dine as there would be no more to be seen till the queen should come up on deck again of the actual ceremony of the knighting of mr drake they had a very fair view though the figures were little and far away 
the first intimation they had that the banquet was over was the sight of the scarlet-clad yeomen emerging one by one up the little hatchway that led below the halberdiers lined the decks already with their weapons flashing in long curved lines and by the time that the trumpets began to sound to show that the queen was on her way from below the decks were one dense mass of colour and steel with a lane left to the foot of the poop stairs by which she would ascend then at last the two figures appeared the queen radiant in cloth of gold and mr drake alert and brisk in his court suit and sword there was silence from the crowd as the adventurer knelt before the queen and anthony held his breath with excitement as he caught the flash of the slender sword that an officer had put into the queen's hand and then an inconceivable noise broke out as sir francis drake stood up the crowd was one open mouth shouting the church bells burst into peals overhead and answered by the roll of drums from the deck and the blare of trumpets and then the whole din sank into nothingness for a moment under the heart-shaking crash of the ship's broadside echoed instantly by the deeper roar of the dockyard guns and answered after a moment or two from far away by the dull boom from the tower and anthony leaned yet further from the window and had it his voice to the tumult as he rode back alone to lambeth after parting with the others at london bridge for they intended to go down home again that night he was glowing with national zeal he had seen not only royalty and magnificence but an apotheosis of character that day there in the little trim figure with the curly hair kneeling before the queen was england at its best england that sent two ships against an empire and it was the church that claimed sir francis drake as a son and indeed a devoted one in a sense that anthony himself was serving here at lambeth and for which he felt a real and fervent enthusiasm he was surprised a couple of days later to receive a note in lady maxwell's handwriting brought up by a special messenger from the hall there is a friend of mine she wrote to come to lambeth house presently he tells me to be kept a day or two in ward before he is sent to wisbeach he is a catholic named mr henry buxton who showed me great love during the sorrow of my dear husband's death and i write to you to show kindness to him and to get him a good bed and all that may comfort him for i know not whether lambeth prison is easy or hard but i hope perhaps that since my lord archbishop is a prisoner himself he has pity on such as are so too and so my pains be in vain however if you will see mr buxton at least and have some talk with him and show him this letter it will cheer him perhaps to see a friend's face anthony of course made inquiries at once and found that mr buxton was to arrive on the following afternoon it was the custom to send prisoners occasionally to lambeth more particularly those more distinguished or who it was hoped could be persuaded to friendly conference mr buxton however was thought to be incorrigible and was only sent there because there was some delay in the preparations for his reception at wisbeach which since the previous year had been used as an overflow prison for papists on the evening of the next day which was friday anthony went straight out from the hall after supper to the gateway prison and found mr buxton at a fish supper in the little prison in the outer part of the eastern tower he introduced himself but found it necessary to show lady maxwell's letter before the prisoner was satisfied as to his identity you must pardon me mr norris he said when he had read the letter and asked a question or two but we poor papists are bound to be shy why in this very room he went on pointing to the inner corner away from the door and smiling for aught i know a man sits now to hear us 
anthony was considerably astonished to see this stranger point so confidently to the hiding-hole where indeed the warder used to sit sometimes behind a brick partition to listen to the talk of the prisoners and showed his surprise ah mr norris the other said we papists are bound to be well informed or else where were our lives but come sir let us sit down anthony apologized for interrupting him at his supper and offered to come again but mr buxton begged him not to leave as he had nearly finished so anthony sat down and observed the prison and the prisoner it was fairly well provided with necessaries a good straw bed lay in one corner on trestles and washing utensils stood at the further wall and there was an oil lamp that hung high up from an iron pin the prisoner's luggage lay still half unpacked on the floor and a row of pegs held a hat and a cloak mr buxton himself was a dark-haired man with a short beard and merry bright eyes and was dressed soberly as a gentleman and behaved himself with courtesy and assurance but it was a queer place with this flickering lamp thought anthony for a gentleman to be eating his supper in when mr buxton had finished his dish of roach and a tankard of ale he looked up at anthony smiling my lord knows the ways of catholics then he said pointing to the bones on his plate anthony explained that the protestants observed the friday abstinence too ah yes said the other i was forgetting the queen's late injunctions let us see how did it run the same is not required for any liking of papish superstitions or ceremonies is it hitherto used which utterly are to be detested of all christian folk no the last word or two is a gloss <laughs> but only to maintain the mariners in this land and to set men a-fishing that is the sense of it is it not sir you fast that is not for heavenly reasons which were a foolish and papish thing to do but for earthly reasons which is a reasonable and protestant thing to do anthony might have taken this assault a little amiss if he had not seen a laughing light in his companion's eyes and remembered too that imprisonment is apt to breed a little bitterness so he smiled back at him they soon fell to talking of lady maxwell and great keynes where it seemed that mr buxton had stayed more than once i knew sir nicholas well he said god rest his soul it seems to me he is one of those whose life continually gave the lie to men who say that a catholic can be no true englishman there never beat a more loyal heart than his anthony agreed but asked if it were not true that catholics were in difficulties sometimes as to the proper authority to be obeyed the pope or the prince it is true said the other or it might be yet the principle is clear date caesari que sunt caesaris the difficulty lies but in the application of the maxim but with us said anthony church of england folk there hardly can be ever any such difficulty for the prince of the state is the governor of the church as well i take your point said mr buxton you mean that a national church is better for that spiritual and temporal authorities are then at one just so said anthony beginning to warm to his favourite theme the church is the nation regarded as religious when england wars on land it is through her army which is herself under arms when on sea she embarks in the navy and in the warfare with spiritual powers it is through her church and surely in this way the church must always be the church of the people the englishman and the spaniard are like cat and dog they like not the same food nor the same kind of coat i hear that their buildings are not like ours their language nay their faces and minds are not like ours then why should be their prayers and their religion i quarrel with no foreigner's faith it is god who made us so anthony stopped breathless with his unusual eloquence 
but it was the subject that lay nearest to his heart at present and he found no lack of words the prisoner had watched him with twinkling eyes nodding his head as if in agreement and when he had finished his little speech nodded again in meditative silence it is complete he answered complete and as a theory would be convincing and i envy you master norris for you stand on the top of the wave that is what england holds but my dear sir christ our lord refused such a kingdom as that my kingdom he said is not of this world is not that is ruled by the world's divisions and systems you have described babel every nation with its own language but it was to undo babel and to build one spiritual city that our saviour came down and sent the holy ghost to make the church at pentecost out of arabians and medes and elamites to break down the partition walls as the apostle tells us that there be neither jew nor greek barbarian nor scythian and to establish one vast kingdom which for that very reason we name catholic to destroy differences between nation and nation by lifting each to be of the people of god to pull down babel the city of confusion and build jerusalem the city of peace dear god cried mr buxton rising in his excitement and standing over anthony who looked at him astonished and bewildered you and your england would parcel out the kingdom of heaven into national churches as you name them among all the kingdoms of the world and yet you call yourselves the servants of him who came to do just the opposite yes and who will do it in spite of you and make the kingdoms of this world instead the kingdom of our lord and of his christ why if each nation is to have her church why not each county and each town yes and each separate soul too for all are different nay nay master norris you are blinded by the prince of this world he is shewing you even now from a high mountain the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them lift your eyes dear lad to the hills from whence cometh your help those hills higher than the mountain where you stand and see the new jerusalem and the glory of her coming down from god to dwell with men mr buxton stood his eyes blazing plainly carried away wholly by enthusiasm and anthony in spite of himself could not be angry he moistened his lips once or twice oh well sir of course i hold with what you say in one sense but it is not come yet and never will till our lord comes back to make all plain not come yet cried the other not come yet why what is the one holy catholic and apostolic church but that there you have one visible kingdom gathered out of every nation and tongue and people as the apostle said i have a little estate in france master norris where i go sometimes and there are folk in their wooden shoes talking a different human tongue to me but thank god the same divine one of contrition and adoration and prayer there we have the same mass the same priesthood the same blessed sacrament and the same faith as in my own little oratory at stanfield go to spain africa rome india wherever christ is preached there is the church as it is here the city of peace and as for you and your church with whom do you hold communion this stung anthony and he answered impulsively in geneva and frankfort at least there are folk who speak the same divine tongue as you call it as we do they and we are agreed in matters of faith indeed said mr buxton sharply then what becomes of your nationalism and the varied temperaments that you told me god had made anthony bit his lip he had overshot his mark 
but the other swept on and as he talked began to step up and down the little room in a kind of rhapsody is it possible he cried that men should be so blind as to prefer the little divided companies they name national churches all confusion and denial to that glorious kingdom that christ bought with his own dear blood and has built upon peter against which the gates of hell shall not prevail yes i know it is a flattering and a pleasant thought that this little nation should have her own church and it is humbling and bitter that england should be called to submit to a foreign potentate in the affairs of faith nay cry they like the jews of old not christ but barabbas we will not have this man to reign over us and yet this is god's will and not that mark me mr norris what you hope will never come to be the liar will not keep his word you shall not have that national church that you desire as you have dealt so will it be dealt to you as you have rejected so will you be rejected england herself will cast you off your religious folk will break into a hundred divisions even now your puritans mock at your prelates so soon and if they do thus now what will they do hereafter but you have cast away authority and authority shall forsake you behold your house is left unto you desolate forgive me mr norris he added after a pause if i have been discourteous and have forgotten my manners but but i would as the apostle said that you were altogether as i am except these bonds end of chapter three part two chapter four of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain a countermarch isabel was sitting out alone in the italian garden at the hall one afternoon in the summer following the visit to deptford hubert was down at plymouth assisting in the preparations for the expedition that drake hoped to conduct against spain the two countries were technically at peace but the object with which he was going out with the moral and financial support of the queen was a corporate demonstration against spain of french portuguese and english ships under the main command of don antonio the portuguese pretender it was proposed to occupy terra sierra in the azores and drake and hawkins entertained the highest hopes of laying their hands on further plunder she was leaning back in her seat with her hands behind her head thinking over her relations with hubert when he had been at home at the end of the previous year he had apparently taken it for granted that the marriage would be celebrated he had given her the gold nugget that she had showed anthony telling her he had brought it home for the wedding ring and she understood that he was to come for his final answer as soon as his work at plymouth was over but not a word of explanation had passed between them on the religious difficulty he had silenced her emphatically and kindly once when she had approached it and she gathered from his manner that he suspected the direction in which her mind was turning and was generously unwilling for her to commit herself an inch further than she saw else whence came his assurance and for herself things were indeed becoming plain she wondered why she had hesitated so long why she was still hesitating the cup was brimming above the edge it needed but a faint touch of stimulus to precipitate all and so isabel lay back and pondered with a touch of happy impatience at the workings of her own soul for she dared not act without the final touch of conviction mistress margaret had taught her that the swiftest flight of the soul was when there was least movement when the soul knew how to throw itself with that supreme effort of cessation into the hands of god that he might bear it along when after informing the intellect and seeking by prayer for god's bounty the humble client of heaven waited with uplifted eyes and ready heart until god should answer and so she waited knowing that the gift was at hand 
yet not daring to snatch it but in the meanwhile her imagination at least might act without restraint so she sent it out like a bird from the ark to bring her the earnest of peace there in the cloister wing somewhere lay the chapel where she and hubert would kneel together somewhere beneath that grey roof that was the terrace where she would walk one day as one who has a right there which of these windows would be hers not lady maxwell's of course she must keep that ah how good god was the tall door on to the terrace opened and mistress margaret peered out with a letter in her hand isabel called to her and the old nun came down the steps into the garden why did she walk so falteringly the girl wondered as if she could not see what was it what was it isabel rose to her feet startled as the nun with bent head came up the path what is it mistress margaret the other tried to smile at her but her lips were trembling too much and the girl saw that her eyes were brimming with tears she put the letter into her hand isabel lifted it in an agony of suspense and saw her name in hubert's handwriting what is it she said again white to the lips the old lady as she turned away glanced at her and isabel saw that her face was all twitching with the effort to keep back her tears the girl had never seen her like that before even at sir nicholas death was there anything she wondered as she looked worse than death but she was too dazed by the sight to speak and mistress margaret went slowly back to the house unquestioned isabel turned the letter over once or twice and then sat down and opened it it was all in hubert's sprawling handwriting and was dated from plymouth it gave her news first about the squadron saying how don antonio had left london for plymouth and was expected daily and then followed this paragraph and now dearest isabel i have such good news to give you i have turned protestant and there's no reason why we should not be married as soon as i return i know this will make you happy to think that our religions are no longer different i have thought of this so long but would not tell you before for fear of disappointing you sir francis drake's religion seems to me the best it is the religion of all the sea-dogs as they name us and of the queen's grace and it will be soon of all england and more than that it is the religion of my dearest mistress and love i do not of course know very much of it as yet but good mr collins here has shown me the superstitions of popery and i hope now to be justified by faith without works as the gospel teaches i fear that my mother and aunt will be much distressed by this news i have written too to tell them of it you must comfort them dear love and perhaps some day they too will see as we do then followed a few messages and loving phrases and the letter ended isabel laid it down beside her on the low stone wall and looked round her with eyes that saw nothing there was the grey old house before her and the terrace and the cloister wing to the left and the hot sunshine lay on it all and drew out scents and colours from the flower beds and joy from the insects that danced in the trembling air and it all meant nothing to her like a picture when the page is turned over five minutes ago she was regarding her life and seeing how the grace of god was slowly sorting out its elements from chaos to order the road was unwinding itself before her eyes as she trod on it day by day now a hand had swept all back into disorder and the path was hidden by the ruins then gradually one thought detached itself and burned before her vivid and startling and in all its terrible reality slipped between her and the visible world on which she was staring it was this to embrace the catholic faith meant the renouncing of hubert as a protestant she might conceivably have married a catholic as a catholic it was inconceivable that she should marry an apostate then she read the letter through again carefully and slowly and was astonished at the unreality of hubert's words about romish superstition and gospel simplicity she tried hard to silence her thoughts but 
two reasons for hubert's change of religion rose up and insisted on making themselves felt it was that he might be more in unity with the buccaneers whom he admired second that there might be no obstacle to their marriage and what then she asked was the quality of the heart he had given her then in a flash of intuition she perceived that a struggle lay before her compared with which all her previous spiritual conflicts were as child's play and that there was no avoiding it the vision passed and she rose and went indoors to find the desolate mother whose boy had lost the faith a month or two of misery went by for lady maxwell they passed with recurring gusts of heart-broken sorrow and of agonies of prayer for her apostate son mistress margaret was at the hall all day soothing encouraging even distracting her sister by all the means in her power the mother wrote one passionate wail to her son appealing to all that she thought he held dear even yet to return to the faith for which his father had suffered and in which he had died but a short answer only returned saying it was impossible to make his defence in a letter and expressing pious hopes that she too one day would be as he was the same courier brought a letter to isabel in which he expressed his wonder that she had not answered his former one and as for isabel she had to pass through this valley of darkness alone anthony was in london and even if he had been with her could not have helped her under these circumstances her father was dead she thanked god for that now and mistress margaret seemed absorbed in her sister's grief and so the girl fought with devils alone the arguments for catholicism burned pitilessly clear now every line and feature in them stood out distinct and hard catholicism it appeared to her alone had the marks of the bride visible unity visible catholicity visible apostolicity visible sanctity there they were the seals of the most high god she flung herself back furiously into the protestantism from which she had been emerging there burned in the dark before her the marks of the beast visible disunion visible nationalism visible erastianism visible gulfs where holiness should be that system in which now she could never find rest again glared at her in all its unconvincing incoherence its lack of spirituality its adulterous union with the civil power instead of the pure wedlock of the spouse of christ she wondered once more how she dared to have hesitated so long or dared to hesitate still on the theological side intellectual arguments of this kind started out strong and irrefutable her emotional drawings towards catholicism for the present retired feelings might have been disregarded or discredited by a strong effort of the will these apparently cold phenomena that presented themselves to her intellect could not be thus dealt with yet strangely enough even now she would not throw herself resolutely into catholicism the fierce stimulus instead of precipitating the crisis petrified it more than once she started up from her knees in her own dark room resolved to awaken the nun and tell her she would wait no longer but would turn catholic at once and have finished with the misery of suspense but even as she moved to the door her will found itself against an impenetrable wall and then on the other side all her human nature cried out for hubert 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 there he stood by her in fancy day and night that chivalrous courteous lad who had been loyal to her so long had waited so patiently had run to her with such dear impatience who was so wholesome so strong so humble to her so quick to understand her wants so eager to fulfil them so bound to her by associations so fit a mate for the very differences between them and now these two claims were no longer compatible 
in his very love for her he had ended that possibility all those old dreams the little scenes she had rehearsed of their first mass their first communion together their walks in the twilight their rides over the hills the new ties that were to draw the old ladies at the hall and herself so close together all this was changed some of those dreams were now for ever impossible others only possible on terms that she trembled even to think of perhaps it was worst of all to reflect that she was in some measure responsible for his change of religion she fancied that it was through her slowness to respond to light her delaying to confide in him that he had been driven through impatience to take this step and so week after week went by and she dared not answer his letter the old ladies too were sorely puzzled at her it was impossible for them to know how far her religion was changing she had kept up the same reserve towards them lately as towards hubert chiefly because she feared to disappoint them and so after an attempt to tell each other a little of their mutual sympathy the three women were silent on the subject of the lad who was so much to them all she began to show her state a little in her movements and appearance she was languid soon tired and dispirited she would go for short lonely walks and fall asleep in her chair worn out when she came in her grey eyes looked longer and darker her eyelids and the corners of her mouth began to droop a little then in october he came home isabel had been out a long afternoon walk by herself through the reddening woods they had never since the first awakening of the consciousness of beauty in her meant so little to her as now it appeared as if that keen unity of a life common to her and all living things had been broken or obscured and that she walked in an isolation all the more terrible in that she was surrounded by the dumb presence of what she loved last year the quick chattering cry of the blackbird the evening mists over the meadows the stir of the fading life of the woods the rustling scamper of the rabbit over the dead leaves the solemn call of the homing rooks all this only last year went to make up the sweet natural atmosphere in which her spirit moved and breathed at ease now she was excommunicate from that pleasant friendship banned by nature and forgotten by the god who made it and was eminent within it her relations to the saviour who only such a short time ago had been the person round whom all the joys of life had centred from whom they radiated and to whom she referred them all these relations had begun to be obscured by her love for hubert and now had vanished altogether she had regarded her earthly and her heavenly lover as two persons each of whom had certain claims upon her heart and each of whom she had hoped to satisfy in different ways instead of identifying the two and serving each not apart from but in the other and now it seemed to her that she was making experience of a divine jealousy that would suffer her to be satisfied neither with god nor man her soul was exhausted by internal conflict by the swift alternations of attraction and repulsion between the poles of her supernatural and natural life so that when it turned wearily from self to what lay outside it was not even capable as before of making that supreme effort of cessation of effort which was necessary to its peace it seemed to her that she was self-poised in emptiness and could neither touch heaven or earth crucified so high that she could not rest on earth so low that she could not reach to heaven she came in weary and dispirited as the candles were being lighted in her sitting-room upstairs but she saw the gleam of them from the garden with no sense of a welcoming brightness she passed from the garden into the door of the hall which was still dark 
as the fire had nearly burned itself out as she entered the door opposite opened and once more she saw the silhouette of a man's figure against the lighted passage beyond and again she stopped frightened and whispered anthony there was a momentary pause as the door closed and all was dark again and then she heard hubert's voice say her name and felt herself wrapped once more in his arms for a moment she clung to him with furious longing ah this is a tangible thing she felt this clasp the faint cleanly smell of his rough frieze dress refreshed her like wine and she kissed his sleeve passionately and the wide gulf between them yawned again and her spirit sickened at the sight of it oh hubert hubert she said she felt herself half carried to a high chair beside the fireplace and sat down there then he rearranged the logs on the hearth so that the flames began to leap again showing his strong hands and keen clear-cut face then he turned on his knees seized her two hands in his own and lifted them to his lips then laid them down again on her knee still holding them and so remained oh isabel he said why did you not write she was silent as one who stares fascinated down a precipice it is all over he went on in a moment with the expedition the queen's grace has finally refused us leave to go and i have come back to you isabel how strong and pleasant he looked in this leaping firelight how real and she was hesitating between this warm human reality and the chilly possibilities of an invisible truth her hands tightened instinctively within his and then relaxed i have been so wretched she said piteously ah my dear and he threw an arm round her neck and drew her face down to his but that is over now she sat back again and then an access of purpose poured into her and braced her will to an effort no no she began i must tell you i was afraid to write hubert i must wait a little longer i i do not know what i believe he looked at her puzzled what do you mean dearest i have been so much puzzled lately thinking so much and and i am sorry you have become a protestant it makes all so hard my dear this is i do not understand i have been thinking went on isabel bravely whether perhaps whether perhaps the catholic church is not right after all hubert loosed her hands and stood up she crouched into the shadow of the interior of the high chair and looked up at him terrified his cheek twitched a little isabel this is foolishness i know what the catholic faith is it is not true i have been through it all he was speaking nervously and abruptly she said nothing then he suddenly dropped on his knees himself my dearest i understand you were doing this for me i quite understand it is what i too and then he stopped i know i know she cried piteously it is just what i have feared so terribly that that our love has been blinding us both and yet what are we to do what are we to do oh god hubert help me then he began to speak in a low emphatic voice holding her hands delicately stroking one of them now and again and playing with her fingers she watched his curly head in the firelight as he talked and his keen face as he looked up it is all plain to me he said caressingly you have been living here with my aunt a dear old saint and she has been talking and telling you all about the catholic religion and making it seem all true and good and you my dear child have been thinking of me sometimes and loving me a little is it not so 
and longing that religion should not separate us and so you began to wish it was true and then to hope it was and at last you have begun to think it is but it is not your true sweet self that believes it ah you know in your heart of hearts as i have known so long that it is not true that it is made up by priests and nuns and it is very beautiful i know my dearest but it is only a lovely tale and you must not spoil all for the sake of a tale and i have been gradually led to the light it was your and his voice faltered your prayers that helped me to it i have longed to understand what it was that made you so sweet and so happy and now i know it is your own simple pure religion and and it is so much more sensible so much more likely to be true than the catholic religion it is all in the bible you see so plain as mr collins has showed me and so my dear love i have come to believe it too and you must put all these fancies out of your head these dreams though i love you i love you and he kissed her hand again for wishing to believe them for my sake and and we will be married before christmas and we will have our own fairy tale but it shall be a true one this was terrible to isabel it seemed as if her own haunting thought that she was sacrificing a dream to reality had become incarnate in her lover and was speaking through his lips and yet in its very incarnation it seemed to reveal its weakness rather than its strength as a dark suggestion the thought was mighty embodied in actual language it seemed to shrink a little but then on the other hand and so the interior conflict began to rage again she made a movement as if to stand up but he pressed her back into the chair no my dearest you shall be a prisoner until you give your parole twice isabel made an effort to speak but no sound came it seemed as if the raging strife of thoughts deafened and paralyzed her now isabel said hubert i cannot i cannot she cried desperately you must give me time it is too sudden you're returning like this you must give me time i do not know what i believe oh dear god help me isabel promise promise before christmas i thought it was all to be so happy when i came in through the garden just now my mother will hardly speak to me and i came to you isabel as i always did i felt so sure you would be good to me and tell me that you would always love me now that i had given up my religion for love of you and now and hubert's voice ended in a sob her heart seemed rent across and she drew a sobbing sigh hubert heard it and caught at her hands again as he knelt isabel promise promise then there came that gust of purpose into her heart again she made a determined effort and stood up and hubert rose and stood opposite her you must not ask me she said bravely it would be wicked to decide yet i cannot see anything clearly i do not know what i believe nor where i stand you must give me time there was a dead silence his face was so much in shadow that she could not tell what he was thinking he was standing perfectly still then that is all the answer you will give me he said in a perfectly even voice isabel bowed her head then then i wish you good night mistress norris and he bowed to her caught up his cap and went out she could not believe it for a moment and caught her breath to cry out after him as the door closed but she heard his step on the stone pavement outside the crunch of the gravel and he was gone then she went and leaned her head against the curved mantel-shelf and stared into the logs that his hands had piled together this then 
she thought, was the work of religion, the end of all her aspirations and efforts, that God should mock them by bringing love into their life, and then when they caught at it and thanked him for it, it was whisked away again and left their hands empty. Was this the father of love in whom she had been taught to believe, who treated his children like this? and so the bitter thoughts went on and yet she knew in her heart that she was powerless that she could not go to the door and call hubert and promise what he asked a great force had laid hold of her it might be benevolent or not at this moment she thought not but it was irresistible and she must bow her head and obey and even as she thought that the door opened again and there was hubert he came in two quick steps across the room to her, and then stopped suddenly. "'Mistress Isabel,' he asked, "'can you forgive me? I was a brute just now. I do not ask for your promise. I'll leave it all in your hands. Do with me what you will. But, but if you could tell me how long you think it will be before you know—' He had touched the right note isabel's heart gave a leap of sorrow and sympathy oh hubert she said brokenly i am so sorry but i promise i will tell you by easter and her tone was interrogative yes yes said hubert he looked at her in silence and she saw strange lines quivering at the corners of his mouth and his eyes large and brilliant in the firelight then the two drew together and he took her in his arms strongly and passionately there was a scene that night between the mother and son mistress margaret had gone back to the dower house for supper and lady maxwell and hubert were supping in sir nicholas old study that would soon be arranged for hubert now that he had returned for good they had been very silent during the meal while the servants were in the room talking only of little village affairs and of the estate and of the cancelling of the proposed expedition hubert had explained to his mother that it was generally believed that elizabeth had never seriously intended the english ships to sail but that she only wished to draw spain's attention off herself by setting up complications between that country and france and when she had succeeded in this by managing to get the french squadron safe at terceira she then withdrew her permission to drake and hawkins and thus escaped from the quarrel altogether but it was a poor makeshift for conversation when the servants had withdrawn a silence fell presently hubert looked across the table between the silver branched candlesticks mother i know what you are thinking but i cannot consent to go through all the arguments i am weary of them neither will i see mr barnes to-morrow at cuckfield or here i am satisfied with my position my son said lady maxwell with dignity i do not think i have spoken that priest's name or indeed any well said hubert impatiently at any rate i will not see him but i wish to say a few words about this house we must have our positions clear my father left to your use did he not the whole of the cloister wing i am delighted dear mother that he did so you will be happy there i know and of course i need not say that i hope you will keep your old room overhead as well and indeed use the whole house as you have always done i shall be grateful if you will superintend it all as before at least until a new mistress comes thank you my son i will speak of that in a moment he went on looking steadily at the tablecloth but there was a word i wished to say first i am now a loyal subject of her grace in all things in religion as in all else and and i fear i cannot continue to entertain seminary priests as my father used to do my my conscience will not allow that but of course mother i need not say that you are at perfect liberty to do what you will in the cloister wing i shall ask no questions and i shall set no traps or spies but i must ask that the priests do not come into this part of the house nor walk in the garden 
fortunately you have a lawn in a cloister so that they need not lack fresh air or exercise you need not fear hubert said his mother i will not embarrass you you shall be in no danger i think you need not have said that mother i am not usually thought a coward lady maxwell flushed a little and began to finger her silver knife however hubert went on i thought it best to say that the chapel you see is in that wing and you have that lawn and and i do not think i am treating you hardly and is your brother james not to come asked his mother i have thought much over that said hubert and although it is hard to say it i think he had better not come to my part of the house at least not when i am here i must know nothing of it you must do what you think well when i am away about him and others too it is very difficult for me mother please do not add to the difficulty you need not fear said lady maxwell steadily you shall not be troubled with any catholics besides ourselves then that is arranged said the lad and now there is a word more what have you been doing to isabel and he looked sharply across the table his mother's eyes met his fearlessly i do not understand you she said mother you must know what i mean you have seen her continually i have told you my son that i do not know why burst out hubert she is half a catholic thank god said his mother ah oh, yes you thank god i know but whom am i to thank for it i would that you could thank him too hubert made a sharp sound of disgust ah yes he said scornfully i knew it non nobis domine and the rest hubert said lady maxwell i do not think you mean to insult me in this house but either that is an insult or else i misunderstood you wholly and must ask your pardon for it well he said in a harsh voice i will make myself plain i believe that it is through the influence of you and aunt margaret that this has been brought about at the moment he spoke the door opened come in margaret said her sister this concerns you the old nun came across to hubert with her anxious sweet face and put her old hand tenderly on his black satin sleeve as he sat and wrenched at a nut between his fingers hubert dear boy she said what is all this will you tell me hubert rose a little ashamed of himself and went to the door and closed it and then drew out a chair for his aunt and put a wine-glass for her sit down aunt he said and pushed the decanter towards her i have just left isabel she said she is very unhappy about something you saw her this evening dear lad yes said hubert heavily looking down at the table and taking up another nut and it is of that that i have been speaking who has made her unhappy i had hoped you would tell us that said mistress margaret i came up to ask you my son has done us uh, me the honour began lady maxwell but hubert broke in i left isabel here last christmas happy and a protestant i have come back here now to find her unhappy and half a catholic if not more and oh are you sure asked mistress margaret her eyes shining thank god if it be so sure said hubert why she will not marry me at least not yet oh poor lad she said tenderly to have lost both god and isabel hubert turned on her savagely but the old nun's eyes were steady and serene poor lad she said again hubert looked down again his lip wrinkled up in a little sneer as far as i am concerned he said i can understand your not caring but i am astonished at this response of yours to her father's confidence lady maxwell grew white to the lips i have told you she began 
but you do not seem to believe it, that I have had nothing to do, so far as I know, with her conversion, which, and she raised her voice bravely, I pray God to accomplish. She has, of course, asked me questions now and then, and I have answered them. That is all. And I, said Mistress Margaret, plead guilty to the same charge, and to no other. You are not yourself, dear boy, at present, and indeed I do not wonder at it, and I pray God to help you, but you are not yourself, or you would not speak like this to your mother. Hubert rose to his feet, his face was white under the tan, and the ruffle round his wrist trembled as he leaned heavily with his fingers on the table. "'I am only a plain Protestant now,' he said bitterly, "'and I have been with Protestants so long that I have forgotten Catholic ways, but—' "'Stay, Hubert,' said his mother, "'do not finish that. You will be sorry for it presently if you do. Come, Margaret,' and she moved towards the door. Her son went quickly past and opened it. "'Nay, nay,' said the nun. Do you be going, Mary? Let me stay with the lad, and we will come to you presently. Lady Maxwell bowed her head and passed out, and Hubert closed the door. Mistress Margaret looked down on the table. You have given me a glass, dear boy, but no wine in it. Hubert took a couple of quick steps back and faced her. It's no use. It is no use, he burst out, and his voice was broken with emotion. You cannot turn me like that. Oh, what have you done with my Isabel? He put out his hand and seized her arm. Give her back to me, Aunt Margaret. Give her back to me. He dropped into his seat and hid his face on his arm, and there was a sob or two. Sit up and be a man, Hubert, broke in Mistress Margaret's voice, clear and cool. He looked up in amazement and with wet, indignant eyes. She was looking at him, smiling tenderly. And now, for the second time, give me half a glass of wine, dear boy. He poured it out, bewildered at her self-control. For a man that has been round the world, she said, you are but a foolish child. What do you mean? Have you never thought of a way of yet winning Isabel? she asked. What do you mean? he repeated. Why, come back to the church, dear lad, and make your mother and me happy again, and marry Isabel, and save your own soul. Aunt Margaret, he cried, it is impossible. I have truly lost my faith in the Catholic religion, and and you would not have me a hypocrite. Ah, ah, said the nun, you cannot tell yet please god it may come back oh dear boy in your heart you know it is true before god in my heart i know that it is not true no 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 she said but the light died out of her eyes and she stretched a tremulous hand yes and margaret it is so for years and years i have been doubting but i kept on just because it seemed to me the best religion and and i would not be driven out of it by her grace's laws against my will like a dog stoned from his kennel but you are only a lad still she said piteously he laughed a little <laughs> but i have had the gift of reason and discretion nearly twenty years a priest would tell me besides aunt margaret i could not be such a a cur as to come back without believing i could never look isabel in the eyes again well well said the old lady let us wait and see do you intend to be here now for a while not while isabel is like this he said i could not i must go away for a while and then come back and ask her again when will she decide she told me by next easter said hubert oh aunt margaret pray for us both the light began to glimmer again in her eyes there dear boy 
she said you see you believe in prayer still but aunt said hubert why should i not protestants pray well well said the old nun again now you must come to your mother and and be good to her end of chapter four